so much edible and technical excitement from Germany. And I'd like to thank Daniel, who sent me some technical devices for analysis, but also backed it up with a lot of candy, quite a lot of candy, including the little German sort of uh, chocolate-coated gingerbread hearts and these incredible things. They look like little nut clusters, but when you bite into them, excuse me while I just bite into one and make a huge mess, mm. Mm. slobber, slobber, they're nut clusters filled with liqueur, and they are so good. Mm. I've never come across those before. Some Haribo gummy bears, but at Gold Baron, um, and these sort of interesting sort of sherbets that you add into a drink and it turns it into a fizzy flavoured drink. But uh, the one which I'm keeping to the end, oh, excuse me, I'm just like gorging my face on liqueurs here. Mm, 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 mm. Mm. Is this Ashen's worthy moment? I'm going to have to save this to the end of this video and we're going to have to try it together because uh, this is Currywurst Mitt Palms. And it's clearly intended to emulate a, a curry sausage with presumably the curry sauce over chips, because mitt palms, the palms is a, a French word for apple, but also it means apple of the earth, which means potato, which is odd, because uh, you keep coming across the word palm for potato. Uh, I think it originates back to being a French word, but these are actually made of marzipan, edil marzipan, if that's pronounced correctly. And I don't know if they're going to be curry flavoured or not, but the only way to find out is to actually eat them, so that's going to be saved to the end of this video. In the meantime, let's get the technical stuff in progress. Mm, mm. I shall put the sherbetty drink stuff to the side and save these chocolates for later. So this uh, device is, and this is where I'm going to pronounce it really badly, Einschaltoptimierung für Grossverbraucher. And I've uh, put that into Google Translate, and it basically says optimization for large consumption. And from what I can make out, this is designed to plug nuisance appliances into it. Appliances that draw a huge spike of current at turn-on. You see, if I bring my notepad in here, when you've got motorised appliances or switch mode power supplies or stuff like that, quite often you turn them on. Even tungsten and lamps do this, the same thing. What happens you turn them on? Instead of the current just going and just being a nice steady current, it actually does this huge spike initially as... In the case of motors, it's the uh, magnetic field being set up. Uh, if it switches on, particularly at a bad position, the sine wave, it can result in virtually, effectively, a dead short appearance in inductive loads. And likewise, if, you're, if you've got a capacitor, it'll, if the capacitor's fully discharged, you'll get a huge spike. So the current will just spike up and then go like that, and then it'll be the normal running current. And uh, this device is possibly designed to prevent against that. So I'm making guesses at what could be inside, and one of my guesses is a uh, NTC inrush current limiter. And we're just going to finish crunching all these little bits in my mouth, mm -hmm. so I don't keep crunching in the middle of the video. Mm. And this particular one, this one uh, starts off, well let's open it up, it says it starts off with a cold resistance of approximately 50 ohms, and it's rated for about 2 amps, so let's get the meter in and just check that. 50 ohms will be a rough provisional value. So if I put the meter across that, uh, is it going to measure anywhere near 50 ohms? It's actually a lot higher. Uh, then again, this house is pretty cold. So uh, 90 ohms. So uh, on 240 volts, that would limit it to about, say, uh, a third of, let's see, uh, the peak current could be 240 divided by about 90 ohms, it'd be about 3 amps initially, it would, you know, it it would really limit that. And what actually happens is that uh, once the it starts conducting current, this resistor heats up and its resistance then lowers down. So, because otherwise it would just get very hot at that resistance. So it goes down to a virtually negligible resistance, just enough to actually keep it uh, in that uh, sort of low conducting, conduction state, that low resistance state. So, very simple way of just clipping the, the spikes. And quite often you'll find these, I'm looking around to see if I can find a power supply, I'm not really seeing a power supply straight away. Quite often you'll find them in uh, the larger switch mode power supplies, the drivers for lights, because uh, they have that fairly large capacitor at the 
at the start of the power supply. It basically means it goes in through a rectifier and then charges that capacitor. And this takes away that spike, which means if you've got lots and lots of lights in the circuit, you're not going to end up with such a high spike that takes out the breaker. So, um, right, so let's open this and see what's inside. Now we've had a little guess. So let's get a screwdriver that's suitable for this. Rake through my screwdrivers here. There's a rogue battery finding its way in. Oh, that's not going to reach. I may have to hunt for another screwdriver that's going to fit down that. So the question is, I do see a little uh, red LED indicator. Is this going to contain more circuitry? Have I guessed its actual function correctly? Let's uh, see if I can find a little screwdriver that is actually going to take that screw out. Uh, that one's a longer reach screwdriver. This should do it. Hmm. Oh, I'm actually seeing a big sooty skid mark. Oh, and crispy wiring. This thing has seen a lot of load. I'm seeing it's actually printed on the side. It says NTC. Let's uh, nudge the brightness up a little bit here. Is that going to help? Uh, NTC... So that is an NTC thermistor, but this also, that looks like a thermal fuse next to it. And this looks like a relay, and is there a possibility that the relay, once this has actually limited that inrush current, then the relay might cut in to bypass that. Um, why is that all black and sooty in there? Can you see that? It's all black and sooty up there. And this this wire has that sort of rigid feel to it. That, uh, there's also a blob of stuff. What is that blob of stuff? Where's my pliers? Let's uh, poke that blob of stuff. I can't find my pliers. I'm very organised today. I've been shuffling everything around here. Uh, these pliers are far too big. OK, right, let's just prise at it with a screwdriver then. So there's a, it's a blob of glue? Oh? Yeah, it's glue, and it's over the screw, but the screw's also got some sort of seal over it. I wonder if that... I'm not really sure. Right, let's uh, pop this circuit board out. Let's break those little seals if we can. And see what's in the back. It's got a lot of capacitors. That would maybe suggest timing circuits. Maybe it is designed to detect... Uh, you know, just basically use the, the NDC thermistor at power up. It's got a chip. Ooh, it's very, it's very, yeah, it's very sooty. It's been seeing a lot of heat. I wonder if this link here is actually a current sense link. It could be. Certainly it's got big beefy soda joints on it. Oh, and it's got, uh, the, the track is split across to that. Yeah, I think that's for sensing. Uh, the NTC thermistor has thermal fuse. The NTC thermistor has the thermal fuse in series with it. It's possibly designed as a sort of last resort. And then the relay contacts are bypassing that. So the relay, when the relay is powered, it is going to... Uh, yeah, it's going to bypass the PTC, the NDC thermistor. So there's a good chance that, you know, when it sees... I guess that makes sense, because if this was something like a washing machine or something with a pulse load where the, the motor starts and stops all the time, then you could have the situation that... Uh, if you just left this on all the time, it would do its job once, and that would be it. And the, even though the uh, washing machine or whatever had turned the motor off and was about to start it again, other loads, like a heating element, might actually stop this from detecting, uh, you know, from resetting. It would still stay warm, even with a low load. Um, even just the control circuits in the washing machine. So maybe the point of the relay is that once it's done its job and the relay bypasses it, it then lets this cool back down again into a, a state that it can uh, protect again. And if it detects another surge, then it might the relay may open again just to allow that to kick in and do its limitation. So the rest of the circuitry is based around a little 
8-pin chip. I have a sneaky feeling it's going to be a more normal 8-pin chip. It's an LM358. It's an op-amp. And that is almost certainly designed to detect transients. It's designed to detect sort of sudden high current switching. I see it coupled via a capacitor from this Ascent uh, resistor, if you will, this inline resistor here. So that is possibly de designed to detect sudden high peak changes of current and then kick the relay out and let that uh, clip the current. It's quite interesting. The rest of the circuitry, we've got a row of, re low, a row of resistors here. Uh, and there across, there are 330k, 334, 33 and 4 zeros. And there across this capacitor, which is almost certainly a capacitive dropper, and has the value of 100 nano, by the look of it. I would guess that it then... Uh, is there a zener? I can see a little diode down there. Oh, is that a zener? No, I'm not really sure. Uh, th there's going to have to be something to clip it. Possibly this diode down here is clipping it. That would make sense. Uh, just to keep the voltage from going too high. One of the other tricks the uh, the manufacturers of the time switches use is they have two transistors. One switches the relay on and one switches a resistor on. The resistor just provides a constant load uh, to keep the voltage around about 24 volts and then when it's the relay turns on, the resistor turns off and the relay turns on, so it's a very simple sort of means of regulation, but I think they may actually have a little uh, a zener in here to actually clip that. It's interesting. It's an, I've never come across one of these before. I shall probably explore it a little bit further later on. Uh, I wonder why it's all gooey. Yeah, that's a bit... It does feel, the, the feel of the wires are such that it does feel like it's been subjected to quite a high load. Right. On with the serious stuff. Do we investigate this currywurst? I think we do. I'm intrigued to see if there is curry flavouring involved. So let's try a bit of the zassage, the worst itself. Or do I try a chip first? Let's try a marzipan chip. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It tastes like marzipan, surprisingly enough. What about this sauce stuff? Is it actually going to have curry? That is a sort of... It's just a sweet, sugary, almost like an icing. I do see some sprinkling over the top of that, of something else. Mm. It's mainly marzipan. There's no uh, curry sensation yet, so let's have a slice of the sausage. No curry. It just tastes like good quality marzipan. So the whole thing is basically themed marzipan, but in the style of chips and sausage with curry sauce. Hmm. I shall be enjoying this later. So yes, uh, all very interesting stuff. I wonder, uh, it does make me wonder that if you've got a machine, or a washing machine or something that's tripping the breaker like that, here in the UK we have different types of breakers. We have um, type uh, the most common. It's very rare to get a type A breaker. You get a type B breaker, a type C breaker, and a type D breaker. And the, most of the ones in residences are, are type B. And the, the letter, the designation, indicates the instant tripping current. Watch like the nuisance tripping current, so to speak, of an inrush. And typically, um, if a breaker's rated, say, 10 amps, and you've got a type B breaker, then you've got two mechanisms for protecting against the overload. You've got the thermal mechanism in the breaker. I should take a breaker apart one day. And that detects a slow creeping overload. Say, for instance, you've got a 10-amp breaker and you overload it by 12, 13, 14 amps. It won't trip instantly. It will actually just heat up very slowly inside and there'll be a time delay and then it'll trip. If you have a dead short circuit or a really high uh, fault current, then it's got a magnetic trip that reacts instantly. But... 
The B, C and D designations indicate, in the case of B, it's five times the rated current, so it would be about 50 amps would be required to trip a 10 amp breaker instantly. For high inrush the loads like, say, motors and things like that, we're more likely to use a type uh, C breaker, which has a multiplier of about 10. So for 10 amps, it would have to be a 100 amp spike to actually cause it to trip instantly. And the D type designation is it's industrial. It's really intended for things like welders. And it's something like 20 amp, uh, should I say 20 times multiplier. And uh, that means that you'd have to, for a 10 amp breaker, it would have to be an inrush, a fault current of about 200 amps before it tripped instantly. But I do know that in other countries, their, their houses are, just because of the way electrical systems have evolved, they sometimes aren't really geared up to really massive loads. Um, in the UK, we have about 100 amps, single phase, 240 volts. It'll actually give us a lot of power in the house. But in other countries, you only have like 32 amps or something for the whole house. And in those instances, you can get situations that are high loads. You have to make decisions beforehand which appliances you're going to use. And the high loads like big washing, washing machines, tumble dryers, things like that, could possibly cause problems by, you know, the inrush current to them. Uh, just pushing things over the edge. And I guess that's where something like this would come in handy, where, you know, a machine was causing that nuisance tripping, and simply by plugging this in line between uh, the wall and the machine, this got rid of that problem by introducing that, uh, that sort of current-limiting facility every time there was that surge. So it's kind of interesting. It must, ultimately, the mass of capacitors, it must just be an analogue algorithm they've come up with to detect a specific level of current transient before it makes a decision of whether it's going to cut the relay out and kick this uh, NDC thermistor back in. And uh, the thermistor will get hot in normal operation. I guess this uh, thermal fuse here, I'm guessing it's a thermal fuse, would have the double function. Since it's next to the relay, it would also detect when the relay had was having problems with the contacts and burning up a little bit. It's 110 degrees Celsius. Yeah, it's a thermal fuse. And it would then break the circuit... Uh, and uh, kill the load. So, uh, yep, it's pretty interesting. It's pretty interesting indeed. I've never seen one of these before.